that it was in the news. You know, I was in high school and a lot was happening. And I, I couldn't have told you a thing about what was even in the headlines at the time, except that there was riots in the streets and stuff. I guess everybody <coughs> heard of that headline back in the 60s. But I came here in 1972, and you wouldn't believe it, but in 1972, when I came here as a student for the first time, woo the People's Park was just a beautiful park. I took, I just took it for granted. <coughs> nice place to study because I was in <coughs> Davidson Hall. Is anybody in Davidson Hall? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to study in there, huh? Just a little bit. <laughs> it was noisy. Everybody wanted like their music, like this is who I am. So it was like music wars up and down the hall. It was crazy. So um, I used to go to People's Park just to read and write, and that was pretty much, I was a poli sci student, so reading and writing, and reading and writing was pretty much what I had to do a lot of all the time, so I just took it for granted until the university decided it needed to transform it into a parking lot, and that was the first time I was ever part of the street battles. I just thought I'd tell you that because if you started off not knowing much about it, boy, I was the same way, and. And um, it never seemed important to me until I saw how much it meant to the University of California to destroy it. <laughs> and it's taken me a long time to figure out why. Because, you know, so it's an international symbol of resistance now. And like, I didn't do that. <laughs> really, the UC Regents did that by deciding that they would bulldoze all the housing in 1967. So it sat empty, as somebody's probably explained. Sat empty for a long time, and people started to build a garden. So I always think the Regents played a really powerful role in the creation of people's Park, and they don't really get the credit they deserve. Mm -hmm. So good evening. Um, it's good to see you. It's really good to see you here. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I want to pay respect to everybody who's fighting for People's Park right now. Because um, of all the struggles that I could name, that one touches my existence. Politics is just stupid issues. And people's part is life. I give the trees and the life, the actual life, giving life in people's park and this whole wasteland of a city. The whole lies that this university is. And People's Park is air, and water, and food, and community. Forgive me for being emotional. I, I just, I had surgery a couple of days ago. And I felt like it was really important to be here because I want you to fight this fight. I want you to fight this fight. I want you to feel like it's important because I just experienced like my sustenance and, and my, uh, I live by myself. And there's a network of people who brought me food and took care of me and looked out for me. And I think, how much is that worth? Like if you put a price tag on that, what would the government charge to have people come and take care of me? It's, you know, it'd be thousands of dollars. But because I'm able to live in the same town for years, because I'm able to put some roots into the ground and build a network of relationships and community, I don't need the fucking government. And the idea of kicking communities out is about breaking those threads of community and those bonds of, of friendship and love 
and connection. And if anything, to me, the People's Park struggle signifies that, those roots in that soil. And I think of that soil of People's Park and all the literal tears, literal blood, literal sweat that has, that has made that place survive despite the billion dollar developers and the billion dollar university that's been trying to conquer it. We're onto something. It's so powerful. <coughs> so, so I feel like I stand among <coughs> friends because if you're in this room and you give a shit about people's part, then you, then you, then you know, you have the knowledge. You know, and this is the real fight. This is our land. Whose land is the people's land? I'm told that any fucking university or corporation or anybody else tell you they own it. So, and that all exists in, in somebody's mind or on somebody's paper. So, anyway, my name is Andrea and I'm with Berkeley Cockwatch. And I, my little chapter starts when um, I came back from Africa. I lived for a couple of years in Zimbabwe. I was a teacher. And I came back and I was kind of actually shocked at how much, did you touch um, How much, uh, <coughs> poverty and want there was in this wealthy community. Like in, in, in Zimbabwe, you could make yourself a, a house. You know, you could find, you could make yourself a shanty town. The government at least recognized that there was a shanty town there. And this notion here of hide the homeless, it was quite offensive. It was quite contrary to what. So, I came out to People's Park one night, and there was a there was a cafe there, and some people from from the Catholic the the Catholic worker. Um, had brought a trailer and put it in people's park. Now that was against the rules, really. Do you guys know this chapter? Does anybody know this chapter? Okay. I do. She knows this chapter. He knows this chapter. Um, you probably know this chapter. Um, so, Dorothy, so it was against the rules because there, one of the rules of people's park was that there'd be no structures. But the Dorothy Day House are anarchist Catholics and they wanted to help the homeless. So they thought it would be dignified to provide a trailer, a place where people could come in out of the rain, smoke a cigarette, and eat some donated food, and not get kicked out. Because it was sort of like a, like a homeless Jim Crow here in Berkeley. You know, where, where if you look like you're homeless, it's okay to kick you out. <coughs> but in this place, it's okay to be here. You can work and mop up, and they pay you in cigarettes. Um, but... The lesson I learned from that chapter was that, was that the, 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 the service providers who wanted to do good, they were like, fuck, the university is telling us to take this trailer out of people's park. And, and, and the social service provider said, but well, we told them to fuck themselves. You know, the university offered us a place of, uh, two blocks away, said we could have that, put the trailer there, but we said no. So one night in the middle of the night, the university comes and they, they said, all right, fuck, you didn't want to negotiate, so they take the trailer out. That night, um, I was in jail, in the UC jail, because I had yanked my arm free from a cop who was, you know, told me to get out of the park, and I came there and was quite appalled that they had done all this. And they told me that, that a young man at Barrington Hall, which was, our, which was a radical co-op at the time, that he had jumped to his death. Uh, an officer told me that there in the jail. Just to fuck with me, really. Um, there was a culture at that time of supporting, of, yeah, there was a culture, there was a connection. Like, when we, we try to organize now, and it's in such a, it's so barren of those places of support. <coughs> And that, that movement that we create needs to be a movement of support for those places. Logistically, we have to create those spaces. And having a place to be like People's Park is so, um, so crucial. You can't grow if you don't have a place to grow. 
So anyway, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> so gentrification, so at that time, what was happening is that the long range development plan of UC, they had decided there were opportunity sites all over. You know, and understand that at this time, they were just coming off the anti-apartheid riots. And the riots during the anti-apartheid movement were different because those, riot, those riots were revolutionary riots. People had, they were fighting for divestment, which was like a, a reformist kind of demand of the university. But the way that people, the, the Shantytown riots, spring around here was called riot season. Um, this, people saw the struggle as a class struggle, as an economic struggle, as a revolutionary struggle. And whatever comes from that, their analysis was very deep. And so when we talk, we talk about gentrification here on the block and opposing the university, when the university is stretching out its tentacles, you know, understand that that's federal government, you know, research and development. Um, and so the you know, it's, it's hard to fight for People's Park and fight against the university and not have kind of a, a, a class analysis of the role of the university in, in capitalism. So, so the long-range development plan. So the city of Berkeley is trying to get along. You know, they, they had been at odds. During the anti-apartheid struggle, the city of Berkeley had told their police not even to send cops to the university to, to uh, support UC cops in the anti-apartheid struggle. <coughs> that was big. You know, the town and gown were very much like this, but this chapter of the People's Park struggle is when they got those forces to align. And they got Mayor Lonnie Hancock, who serves as our assemblywoman, assembly person now, Lonnie Hancock, she's out now, Nancy Skinner's she's, she's out, yeah. She's out. Um, but Lonnie Hancock was the mayor at the time, and her, her husband, Tom Bates, was in the assembly. And they did the old bait and switch, right? Yeah. <laughs> bait and switch. Um, so she was, was on course to make a, an agreement with the university. So they made this, this crazy ass agreement. This is how we're gonna bring town and gown together. The city was going to lease the West End and the East End of People's Park for one dollar. And they would, I mean, have, think about it, joint jurisdiction over People's Park. So the university was going to have the middle and the city was going to have the ends. Like, what, what madness? What, what? They were ultimately told that they couldn't do that. Um, they changed the arrangement, but basically the idea was to get town and gown on the same on the same page. The idea that the city make it easier for the university to develop, and so part of that was getting rid of counterculture, getting rid of homeless people, getting rid of of stopping this riot culture, this revolutionary culture. You know, the whole Occupy movement and all these a lot of these movements today had their roots in Berkeley struggles against the university. And then Berkeley gentrified and gentrified to the point where a lot of these like left-minded social worker kind of people can't afford to live here anymore. And so the struggle has moved, and those people have moved on to co to grow, inculcate other movements. But a lot of that started around around here. Um. Anyway, so uh, um, I'm trying to keep some track of my time. So. City Lonnie Hancock and UC Chancellor Michael Heyman signed a memorandum of accord. Um, and so in this way, they were fighting each other. So we went through, so I'm with Copwatch, and Copwatch started in March of 1990. Um, in, 19, in March of 1990, we started to get people to, to walk up and down the streets and, and oppose, try to document the ways in which the police were trying to dislodge homeless people. And so they were using all kinds of, you know, same thing, taking their stuff, um, but kind of, uh, you know, anti-panhandling ordinances were proposed, anti-sitting ordinances were proposed. Even in 1990, they were trying to pass these things and failing. Um, so in 1990, Ocean Newman, for example, a lawyer who was representing homeless people was beaten up in People's Park. Um, and he represented, he's the guy who helped to paint the mural, uh, the People's Park mural. 
So he's the people's lawyer, and he's been there all the time. He got beaten up by two cops in People's Park when he was uh, uh, speaking to his client. <coughs> and so that set off a, a, a protest. And on the site that is now being constructed right across from People's Park, it was a, there was a fence around it for 20, 30 years, almost 30 years. Um, that was called the People's Park Annex. Once upon a time, it had a building there called the Berkeley Inn. And the night that we had a protest against the beating of Ocean Newman, that building burned. And they accused Cop Watch of having set that fire. But there was funny business in this city. So somebody tried to somebody tried to arson that building. That oh, building was raised. It. it was arson. It was arched a couple of times. So that building was taken down. Um, and it stood as an open lot for some time. In January of 1991, January 4th, um, the police seized the freeze the free box. Have you guys talked about free box? Uh, we haven't. Yeah. Okay. So this the free box. It's just a box that, that receives clothes, you know, and, and it was put there when the, when the park was first created. There was a free box where you dump clothes anytime. But, you know, that free box can be life-saving. You know, when you, you get out of jail at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and you come and it's winter time and it's freezing cold, you can go to the free box and it would have a cover over it. You can get clothes. You know, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just clothes. It was part of the culture of sharing. It was part of the culture of sharing. It was part of the whole community thing. So the university, the chancellor says, oh, that's unsightly, that's ugly. So they send their cops in and they take it down. We say, well, all right, fuck that. And we put it back. Put it back. At least so we, then that went on for time. two weeks in, in January. I was looking it up this morning. Two weeks in January, it was 15 days, seven free boxes. So they would build it, we would build it. They would come in the middle of the night with crowbars, yeah, and we them. would protest it, and then build it again, and <laughs> went on quite a long time. And eventually, we won. We're they still they stopped that. Yeah. yeah. Sadly, we lost it a couple of years ago. Um, but that was the first. So, the, so understand the idea of development. If you're trying to build a bunch, you know, turn this area into like a shopping mall from Walnut Creek, you don't want a bunch of people laying around in the doorways. You can't have demonstrable poverty and demonstrable resistance in the mix. It doesn't go. It scares the suburbanites who they want to come here and buy the shit they want to sell. So they're doing a displacement. It's a. It's not an ethnic cleansing. It's a, you know, on some level it is. Culture. But it's a. It's a cultural and a class cleansing, making a place safe for consumers from the suburbs. And that's exactly what was happening. So they were. They were using. Uh, uh, these techniques of, of taking away, trying to go after food, not bombs, and go after service providers. And you can move, relocate the services, you can relocate the poor people. And that's why they're always trying to move services down to West Berkeley or some other part. Get it out of sight, out of mind. That's why there's special laws that only apply to Telegraph Avenue and Shattuck, like the three dog law. You guys know that one, right? That if three, if three homeless people hang out together and they have, all have a dog, three not homeless people, anybody, the law is equal. Um, but if three people who happen to have dogs hang out in the same area on Telegraph or on Shattuck, then they can cite, the police can cite those people. No, no, the poor folks around here couldn't have it. Oh, I'm so scared. Somebody came up and asked if they could wash my window. And they had so they passed dogs. a law against it. And they had three dogs. And they had three dogs. Yeah, it was, it was naked and smoking. Um, so, but these are laws, and the gen process of gentrification happens on a city level, happens on, you know, but they also went after the young kids of color. You know, <coughs> Friday and Saturday night on Telegraph Avenue, there was record stores and pizzas and all kinds of, like, consumables, and it was a nice place to meet other young people and that whole scene, blah, blah, blah. They sent, they, would, they, they devoted extra police resources, started ticketing for jaywalking, towing illegally parked cars, to going to stores, going to, going to places Little noodle shops that stay open till one in the morning say, ah, you gotta close. I mean, it was not, the gentrification was not subtle. It was not subtle. So by the time they came from People's Park, you know, they had already been, been trying to whittle away at the base of resistance and the folks that might actually stand up for the park. Um, so there we go. Um, So yeah. So 
So, in, on July 31st, 1991, which is her birthday, which is she my birthday, they invaded on my birthday, which is yeah. one of the ruder things I think they could do. Um, they, and so, uh, you know, they've been given all this bullshit about sports courts and talking about the language they were using was that we want to be inclusive. This should be everybody's park. Why is it just the poor people's park? Why can't rich people come? Why can't you? No, no, no. And trying to do this bullshit like you know, inequality is somehow equal. You know, and God, it's like we step into their headset. It doesn't make sense anymore. You know, of course, like they see, I mean, there was absurd demonstrations of like volleyball courts. How dare you play volleyball on the misery of poor people and the gaping need that there is in our community, and instead of helping people, you blame them? How dare you? As if, as if there's something about the soil of people's park that makes people morally decrepit. I'd love to. Come on in. Come okay. on in. Okay. Volleyball. <laughs> they did us a favor when they decided the next incarnation for the park had to be volleyball. And I'll tell you why. Um, I only found out in the middle of horrendous depositions after the fact that volleyball is a very complicated game. Mm -hmm. They would not allow people to just like play three on one side, three on the other side. You had to have a regulation game of volleyball for which you need 18, does anybody know this? 18 people? Anybody play volleyball? <laughs> which is probably a really fun well, that must thing to be, play. Well, you had to have nine people on each side. They have to snake in a certain direction. One of the UC cops over here was knowledgeable about volleyball. And boy, he would watch every game, and he would go to jail. I sure did if you were building a sand castle in the sand. So oh, that's right. this was so ludicrous that it actually enlisted a lot of students and a lot of the community to just come and join a protest because it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so we, we, we did some pretty funny things, including, you know, building sand castles <laughs> and so forth. But it's really important, I think, that they chose so badly. There were a number of ways they could have uh, demonstrated their disrespect for the park. But this one was actually really, really funny. One of my favorite photographs of the time is a volleyball court a volleyball sitting in a toilet. Somebody managed to punch it right into the bowl. So we had signs that said they will kill for volleyball because they were trying to kill us. Some of the protests uh, were very, very vicious and we were part of the crew which on, on Andrew's birthday just went off with the uh, sit in a circle kumbaya crew. But there were a lot of people who stayed and had, it was a huge, huge cop riot, in Easy my words. opinion. We did, I did an analysis with um, another of the cop, uh, CD Inc. workers. So what began to happen was more and more protests, more and more arrests. So CD Inc. was a group uh, headed, headed by Ocean Newman. But what it really was was an office and a phone, and I was the office coordinator. I had 50 lawyers out there uh, who did civil rights and criminal work who were ready to make sure you didn't take a plea. And the idea is, since most of the courts right now are a big plea machine where you get your beautiful, clean record eaten up, instead of that, we would make sure that each and every person who was had any kind of charges, I knew I would put it into a spreadsheet there, and I happen to have a good memory, so I knew everybody's arresting officer, everybody's charges, what day it happened, where did it happen, what time it happened, and when the first court date was. And we made sure everybody's uh, injuries were photographed, taken to the hospital, make sure they were seen by physicians, made sure everybody had a record of the, what Cop Watch was beginning to do, making sure that if there was a, uh, an abuse by a police officer, we could document it. We could make sure to keep track of which officers were doing that routinely, because often there was a pattern. And before cop watch, we didn't have any clarity about that. So out of, in, the, in uh, the first six months, there were over 400 arrests, almost 450 arrests, only two convictions. So I was really proud of the work that I did with lawyers, who are, many of whom are still practicing today, including Ocean Newman. They were at the ready to defend People's Park in this way, making sure that people were safe as possible to attend a protest, which might have started out peaceful and full of music, 
but sometimes the police officers here would turn it into something else again. So that was just one of the things that was born that I, I was really proud to be part of. But the other thing I am is a musician and an artist. So I did a lot of things like this. That I came, I saw uh, was, oh, it is. I put these on there because people took them home. It says, not a souvenir. Return to Carol Denny. Yours or yours for a $10 contribution. Oh, I thought not, because people wanted to just take them home. But I made over 50 of those so we could all dance with them one time for a, um, a demonstration. I did a lot of really ludicrous things that way because I really wanted to lighten the mood and hope that pe things would be a little more peaceful than they otherwise would be. And I was not alone. Andrea and Richard Lisp and Ray Reese were other artists and poets and sculptors who did outrageously creative things on behalf of People's Park. And part of the reason that I bring it up is that I worked hand in hand with David Adell, who was the owner of Ashkenaz, the dance club that's still down there. Do you guys know Ashkenaz? Uh, it's a great place to dance, and they have great food, vegetable <coughs> food. And what he knew is what you will also see if you pay attention to what happens in People's Park. When there's great music, oh, all of a sudden everybody understands. People connect, people dance together, but they it changes the whole sense of that area, which is an amazing area, and I'll get to that later. But David and I started a, we, we also started a little newspaper out of Ashkenaz that highlighted the expenditures that UC was making on the, on the uh, you know, security. Because people love to do what I did one day, which is just take washable hot pink chalk and write the cost of the volleyball court right on the volleyball court, and they threw me in jail. So that kind of thing was really interesting to us, interesting to write about, and started to really annoy the community around us. So David and I were two of the people that the University of California, I'm moving to the SLAP suit now, so anybody know what SLAP is an acronym for? Maybe not, but it's an acronym for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. So the idea is all oh, these arrests, almost 450 arrests, and people are still showing up for the protests. They're still opposing us in People's Park. What are we going to do? You know, beating people up and trying to give them a criminal record isn't working very well. So they tried the slap suit, which has been very effective in, in some settings. And the idea is we'll take We'll move out of the criminal courts where you get a public defender if you need one, although we covered people with more sophisticated lawyers who were dedicated to going to the wall for people. And you move into a civil court. A slap suit is a civil court suit against you or you or you. And the idea is, no, you don't get a lawyer if you're sued. So all of a sudden, you can't get out of it without just losing. And it's, it's a very expensive thing to hire an attorney. In this case, the way it worked for me and David Nadal was, it was a Thursday morning, January 9th, 1992, I, my phone rang, and I thought, okay, I picked it up, and it was this guy at the other end who said, well, you have to be in Superior Court in Oakland tomorrow at 9 a.m. in department something. Uh, you're being sued by the University of California. And I was such a fool, I said, oh, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> no, was it? Oh, I didn't know. So I hang up the phone, and then the phone rings again, and I go, hello? And it was David Nadell who said, did you get a really weird phone call? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I did. He goes, well, Bob Sparks got one, too. Uh, you want a ride? we got to go down to court. And what was really funny was we'd get down to court, and we were so lucky we had Ocean Newman and Jim Chan, who you, you will meet tomorrow at the, uh, the uh, panel. Uh, and uh, David Bovey, they're flipping through these charges against us, and they, and they turn around to me and they, they said, like, did you beat up a football player? Like, it was just full of nonsense. But the idea of a slap suit is it doesn't have to be true. It'll take you years to get into court. And in those years, you have to pay for depositions. You, it, it, the idea is to make it so expensive to keep uh, protesting, to keep writing, to keep singing, in my case, having written a song called See You in Santa Rita was held against me as an incitement to violence, as were these. 
So any, any of you know the phrase, Veni Vidi Vici? This was a joke to me. It's a pun. It's I came, I saw, I conquered in Latin. And so I just wrote, I came, I saw on these because we knew we could eventually get rid of the volleyball courts, and we did. But it wasn't that we tore them out. It was that they were so stupid, so expensive, so ludicrous in a park that is an internet, internationally renowned as a symbol of resistance, that eventually they realized they couldn't afford those volleyball courts. And the 24 hour a day police protection that they require. So I'm gonna move swiftly to a couple of other things so we have time for questions and stuff because I'd love to hear your thoughts. But one of the things that I brought, and I think this is crucial, is that I didn't really know the extent that the People's Park Native Plant Forum had uh, gone to do this project until they went and ripped it out just this d December. But what I brought here is a list of, that was part of the landmark application. Oh yeah, you can just hand these all out. These are a work of art. <coughs> just hand them around for anybody interested. What they did, this was people, I was a gardener in the West End, so I didn't know much about this, but I just did a lot of reading about it. And I wanted you to know about it because it had a profound effect on me. What they did was decide that the whole East End would represent 19, the 19 native plant cultures in the state of California. Now, 2.8 acres or so, that's hard to do because some of it is coast redwoods and some of it is riparian. And you'll find it all documented on there. They worked so hard and the idea was these are the native plants of California in case you weren't sure which were native. You could just walk to People's Park and the idea was, this was a severely educational project. You know, usually in a botanical garden, you have to walk a long way to go from the coastal redwoods to the riparian. But you could do it all in People's Park just by taking a few steps. And that was very real. That was part of what documented the notice of decision for the landmark status that was granted in 1984. They did all of this work so that they could show not just the University of California, but also the citizens of Berkeley that this was serious, it was real, that you could use this irreplaceable urban open space to do this amazing educational project, never done before, absolutely unique in the state of California. And that's what they just destroyed in December up there. But what we can replant, just so you know, this will be a wonderful opportunity for people to get back together. And you sure have the map right there of exactly what went where. And a lot of those trees got really tall. I mean, uh, uh, People's Park is now 50 years old. And I guess when I first saw it, I just took it for granted. I thought it had been there a long time. <laughs> but I realized it was really, really young. And people were already working so hard to illustrate um, native plants, native culture, and this new way of organizing that honored everyone so that nobody is shoved to the side. And I'm so glad that Andrew talked about gentrification. And that is something that I always think is really, it's such a huge, such an important thing to recognize because people's part I was taking classes over here and reading about injustice. People's Park illustrated all of that injustice beautifully because a lot of the people there had suffered racism, sexism, being, being evicted, like Jim Channon was in the middle of finals. Can you imagine? Finals was hard for me. I, like, I can't imagine having to immediately have to find a new place to live. So there was a lot of people came together because of what they had suffered and because of what they wanted to build together. So help yourself to anything. One of the other things I did was start the Pepper Spray Times. It is all political comedy, always free. And um, I've been doing it ever since I realized it's <coughs> 30 years old now, sometimes twice a month because my, my uh, orientation, just like David Nadell's was, well, music and art 
helps people remember like who they met, where, and what song was playing. There's something about it that threads my life together more easily if I incorporate music, art, and sculpture. So um, I want you guys to know that uh, what, what we do to celebrate the park and to defend the park is absolutely a right place for that kind of energy. And I look forward to meeting any of you who, have, who are artists who have ideas about how to do creative resistance. Now, um, so I think that's my yeah. ten, yeah. And then, um, do y'all have any questions? Yeah, I'm glad to. Talk. Yeah. Um, well, you said that uh, they got the historical landmark um, because of the trees. The landmark status. Landmark status. Not because of the trees. Oh. Though. it's bigger than that. Okay. Yeah. What it actually says, and I should probably just read it. It says, whereas, oh. Therefore, whereas a public hearing has been had and uh, we've decided, now therefore be it resolved that the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the City of Berkeley, that the decision, oh, that's not it either. Oh, declare the site, commonly known as People's Park, a landmark for its historical and cultural significance. I'm glad you asked that question because it's not for any particular tree. It's certainly not for any particular structure. It's not for anything that stays in one place. It's because of a culture. And so landmarking the significance, the historic, uh, the historical significance of the culture was brutal for the regents who were trying to destroy that culture, which, as Andrew pointed out, there were poetry readings every night. That's where I met Russ the first time. There were, you could folk dance every night of the week. This, those things were free. So if you know, you were a student, you didn't have much money uh, to go even pay five bucks to get into a dance club. There was so much to do that was free. And a lot of those poets, we were in a play together, remember that? Sheep in rubber underwear, yeah. We did, uh, it, was, it was mind bogglingly creative. And it terrified the regions. One of my other favorite things, <coughs> uh, this is a long answer, it's just that if you read, and this is a public document, public documents all, the Regents' meetings from the 1950s are a riot because they're terrified of rock and roll. They're terrified of homosexuality. You know, there was a burgeoning gay culture here in San Francisco Bay Area, not quite as cool as it is now, but it was happening. And they were just terrified. They wanted to be Harvard. They wanted to be Yale. They did not want their students to hear the word Marxism and all of this stuff was just exploding. I hope that, yeah. Anybody else? Even if it's not a question, I, I gotta say, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have about what's happening now or the tree cutting or anything. And, and there's one other thing I'd love to add. <laughs> and that's this. Because some people are falling for the idea that because of the housing crisis, that, oh, well, I guess we better sacrifice People's Park. I mean, we need more housing. I just wanted to point out, this is the south side of campus, a map I made, that's going to be part of a, um, a skit I'm going to do as Chancellor Carol Chris. But I made it so that you could kind of see that over here, see this little tiny green space? Right there is People's Park. See how tiny it is? I'll pass this around. That's 2.7 acres or 2.8, it's a little between. Over here, just a couple blocks away, is 10 acres that the University of California already owns, that they already have housing on, extant housing, and they have hundreds of units that slid in the 89 earthquake off their foundation that they're not using. So don't ever think this is about housing. And then down here, 130 acres. But again, they all own, it all belongs now to the University of California. Because when it was first established in the 1860s, it was against the law to have any housing of any kind on campus. That law eventually changed, but they prefer to cannibalize the town around them rather than build on their glorious campus. So I had to add that. Yeah. And I'll pass this around. Want to pass that around? There you go. <coughs> One more thing. Oh, God. But, uh, why don't you text me? Okay. In case, oh, sure. There's a question. 
So um, last semester, uh, the university used to have a piano that was sitting in front of uh, oh, the Sprout, so and it got neat. busted. And uh -huh. it was actually a People's Park activists that brought the new piano back to the university. Um, how, but that person, one of them, was named Donovan, and they actually got a stay away order um, after interacting with the students. I had one too. Yeah, and, and so I'm trying so to. So proud of our stay away orders. I guess something, if you could illuminate for me, what's What's the, um, how do we combat the tactics of the university trying to put stay away orders on people? Solidarity. Order, Solidarity. Yeah, that's and, a great um, question. How do students become a part of, like, no, these are people actually helping us and creating an environment that's safe and community centered rather than, like, pushing them aside? Because you were talking about gentrification. I see the stay away orders as being a part of that. Um, could you talk a little bit yeah. more? Yeah, yeah. Um, that is one of the tactics that they use to divide people. And um, one of the things that we used to do when we, we would always have meetings in People's Park and more and more of us got those stay away orders so we would have them right at the edge of the park so that nobody was technically violating their stay away order. Our meetings would go out onto the sidewalk and around. I, I'm, I'm gonna also, but solidarity is pretty much the key um, we have everything in common with each other. We really do. And they would love to convince us otherwise. So that's, that, I, it sounds like a really easy answer, but if you stop, you know, there's just no way you can hate somebody if you, if you end up building a free box with them. <laughs> can I, can I, has, do you guys know what he's talking about in the stay away orders? Is there, really, is there anybody who doesn't know that is? I see some nodding heads. <laughs> so, so what happens is that, is that, according to the California Penal Code, oddly, the University of California has been given the authority to issue a stay away order and withdraw permission to be on campus for up to seven days before you're required to have a hearing. And some of us have been concerned that, well, that's, that's putting the punishment before the opportunity to have the hearing. You know, that's, and so they use that same tactic against tree sitters in Memorial Glade. Um, they used it in anti-apartheid. They use it very politically. Um, and a lot of times it's against outside, outside activists. They want to keep, they, they have this notion that, that students are children and that they need to be protected from the outside, the corrupting outside. The corrupting outside. Of, of the outside agitator or the community at large. And then they, they've got a point. But unity and solidarity is really fucking scary. Yeah. And really important. It's um, I just want to add one last thing, and then uh, if there's no other class, I'm glad to hang and talk. But in May of 1978, it's so cool, I have what's called a letter of agreement. This was being done with the Native, uh, the People's Park Native Plant Forum, and also the People's Park Council and a guy who was the Associate Vice Chancellor for Business Affairs, Ted Chenoweth, who is still living, lives in Sonoma. And the whole idea is a letter of agreement between the University of California, Berkeley campus, and the People's Park Forum and the Native Plant Forum to discuss all matters uh, before there's any conflict, to make sure if there's any significant changes that you check in with somebody. With, uh, it was a recipe for avoiding conflict. So that was the initial one, and then they have coordinations for use of People's Park was in August of 1979, and then in January 5th of 1979, a letter of understanding. These are legal documents which are operative today, that they're ignoring. So one of the things we're exploring is just going to court and saying, well, we don't think you're following the contract we have with you, because these are very real, and they were done by uh, David Axelrod, who'll be here playing at the Art House Gallery on, on uh, March 16th, and we're just going to document the destruction of the, the east end of what is a landmark, which means it's a CEQA issue. So if you're interested in it, in the, I love ephemera like that. I, I really get a kick out of it. And there is one other thing, which is right here, this lists all of the landmarks adjacent to People's Park, including a national landmark, that church across the street. And it's just interesting because it says, clustered around what is known as People's Park is the richest concentration in Berkeley of the work of prominent architects and a variety of architectural styles spanning some 50 years. 
this is important because this is a whole neighborhood that should be treated with respect. Mm. Right. Um, anybody else have any questions? Right. Do you guys want to? I mean, did you guys know all this? We've been talking to the majority. Of it. You knew most of it. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there anything you want to ask me? Uh, I mean. I like I, I I guess like I could say a quick thing like I mean I I, I see people's part is like it's like, like they've said like it's not about the particular trees although the project of the trees on the east end is a very beautiful idea um, and what what it really comes down to is like the school eminent domain the land they took it from its owners they built a parking lot there and the people came together regardless of the echelon of life that they were work that they lived in like the homeless the students you know the upper class the lower class the middle class they all came together in, in, and they created this like beautiful sanctuary for like just like the lost, the distant, the outcasts, uh, and the just general community come together and, 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 and to meet with one another. And, and the reason I see the, the, the school is actually attacking this park at this point in time is they want to erase the history That's right. of the fact that they have blood on their hands because of this park. Like they shot at 150 students almost 50 years ago, killing one of them, blinding several. Right, and and, and, and and they they want people to forget that history. They want they want to be this happy-go-lucky school that hasn't done anything wrong, and to convince everybody that they couldn't be wrong. Right, and and, and moving forward from that, like when 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 you look at various different sculptures throughout the school, a lot of them used to have placards on them, like the one at the very base of the school. It's this big old orb. Looks like it's splitting apart with like things. Well, that's actually an artist's rendition of the splitting of the atom because. A lot of the mathematics and a lot of the stuff that was for making uh, the atomic bomb and, and, and creating nuclear sites was actually done here. So there used to be a placard that explained that. Well, they removed that placard. And if we allow them to build student housing in this park and put a placard next to a tree about how this used to be the site of people's park. Yeah, that's how enough. Many, <laughs> how many years till they take that placard away? And then future generations won't get to know that we as the people, if we unite as one, it doesn't matter what they throw at us. We have and are the power. And that's the importance of this park as a whole. The park being a park is because it is the people's park and it is truly a symbol of what we are as one. I gotta say, pulling out that parking lot in, in 79 was really fun. People brought food, played music, and you know, slab by slab, that asphalt was gone. Everybody like shared the pickaxe. So, yeah, I love that the way you put it. Yeah, <coughs> just the one last thing you got. I, I think it would be disrespectful to to close out and not acknowledge one one little part of this. That the resistance in People's Park. We didn't talk. Did you guys talk about Rosebud De Novo? We haven't talked about Rosebud. Okay, so what I want to tell you is that, is that, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, what can I say? There's nonviolent struggle, there's cultural struggle, there's struggle for our, our, our heads and our hearts, and, and there's, there's cultural struggles and ways that we, we create to come together and try to build our movement and be bigger so we all can sit down together and do some great nonviolent action. But you know what? There was also resistance of property destruction and ways of getting the attention of the university. And, and people tried to burn down the volleyball court. And, and people, you know, Bob Sparks took a chainsaw and cut, the, cut, it, cut it down. And somebody cut drove this. a car into it. There's, yeah. there's, been, and there's been all kinds of resistance. So I don't want you to get the idea that that has not happened. And Rosebud De Novo had this idea, you know, which was, I believe, uh, what can I say? It was, it was sort of tragic. She thought that she could liberate People's Park by going in and taking a machete and actually trying to assassinate the chancellor of the university. And she went into his house. She only, she stood about this high. She was a little tiny 19, 20 year old girl from Kentucky, a little homeless person. She ran away from abuse and came here. And she was like, she believed in this. And I guess, you know, I'm not saying that that's what you have to, but, to do, but I guess I, what, I, what I'm asking you to just consider is that what is the you know what is a freedom fighter? And what is somebody who goes off to Syria or Afghanistan 
You know, and the same question that Muhammad Ali asked, you know, why would I go over there and fight and give my life, you know, to fight in Vietnam, you know, when the people who are after me are right here, when I can fight and die right here. And how, you know, I look at the people who, who they, you see what I'm saying? Why don't we take this struggle seriously? Why don't we take ourselves seriously? Why don't we take the Ohlone history seriously? Why don't we inherit that and pass it on? May I add, I, I'm glad you brought up Rose, but uh, I was the one who supervised her um, community hours. And I have to say, she was facing really serious charges. And she, she would get kicked in the head, awake, wherever she was sleeping outside. So um, she was going through a lot at the time that she conceived this um, plan. She was uh, so frustrated. She felt like we weren't doing enough. Those of us who were trying to organize events and stuff like that. She was very impatient with um, our inability to just get rid of them. She was, well, she, and she was a lot younger than, than most of us were. So she came all the way from Kentucky because she thought this was, that Berkeley was the place where her values would be reflected, where she could find the community that would really understand what she, what she was about. And she was a little frustrated with us. So I feel kind of responsible in some ways for her decision to take this really dra drastic action. And, it, and it's still very hard on me that we lost her. She was shot in the back by a cop. So um, one of our losses. Anyhow, I know we're going long. I'm so thankful to have a chance to talk to you guys. And uh, glad to have you.